Thank you, Madam Chair and members Senator of the committee. Lucero. I want to uh, come before you today and speak about House File 1507, Madam Chair. Please proceed. So, Madam Chair, 1507 has to do with student data privacy, and I am very proud that this topic is, is a broadly bipartisan topic. It concerns many different stakeholders, and it is one that there's been a lot of support for. So uh, what I want to do is just give an introduction here. I have a PowerPoint presentation to uh, bring some background uh, and then go over the bill. And then I have some testifiers after that. So uh, Madam Chair, I'll start with the presentation. Sounds good. So student data privacy has two goals in mind. And it is to protect student private data as well as ensure parental authority over their children's private data. So by way of background, current Minnesota state statute has uh, chapter 125B and it's titled Education and Technology. And in fact, I have it right here. The number of pages is only five in length. It is very slim, as you can see. It dates back to 1980. And uh, there are a couple sections in it. One section is contracts for computers and equipment in schools. That section has not been updated since the year 2000. The section MDE department duties has not been updated since 2003. The section titled Internet Access for Students uh, it has not been, for all intents and purposes, updated since 2007. Now in 2015, there was a, just a minor change, an insignificant change. Uh, point, the definition of a charter school pointer was changed. So aside from that, it hasn't changed since 2007. So with that, the, the topic of, of technology and students, for all intents and purposes, it's been at least a decade since there's been any changes, uh, and that's a lot of time. But during that same amount of time, innovations in technology, as we're all well aware, have exponentially created a plethora of new technology capabilities. Positive benefits from these new capabilities are indeed many, one of them being the use of technology in the classroom better prepares students to be more competitive in the global workforce. It allows, technology has allowed for an increase of efficiencies and a decrease of, of costs for our schools to better use uh, limited resources. And there are many other benefits to the innovations that have occurred within the technology space and using those technologies in the uh, academic and education context. But the problem is, with those innovations and increased capabilities in technology, uh, there is much alarm among parents. And that's big data. So what big data is, uh, it's the mass collection and aggregation of student information. And you can see that by the graphic there in the, in the lower right hand corner, there are multiple pieces of information that are all collected and then aggregated together. Multiple sources into a single source. Big data then after collection is stored and data warehoused. Once it's collected and stored, that allows for uh, data correlation and data mining. These multiple data points uh, can, be, can be data mined. And we're familiar with data mining in this committee for sure. Data mining allows for the establishment of patterns. It allows for the building of profiles on students. It harvests intelligent, actionable information that can be used by the audience or whoever, whatever the, the purpose is. In other, words, in other words, big data is the intersection of information, uh, analytics, and human behavior. Sharing of student private data with third parties uh, is a huge concern because after it's collected, uh, stored, data mined, and profiles built, that data can be shared with third parties. And that is what is happening today. Madam Chair. So, 
Uh, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Representative Lacero, is it only happening in the education area, or is all government data big data based on your slideshow presentation? Uh, Lacero. Madam Chair and Representative Hillstrom, big data is a problem amongst all government and the private sector. Mm -hmm. data, mine, data collection and data mining is occurring across departments and across private sector, and it's a huge concern, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wonder, Representative Hillstrom, if the Department of Health sells the data that they receive to other parties, to third parties, if that's what you're getting at. Uh, Madam Chair, it doesn't have to be sold if it's public information. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And so last year, uh, I, last session, I was a member of the Education Policy Committee. This year, I'm not. But last year, we had an informational set, uh, session in which uh, the department, MDE, Minnesota Department of Education, came down and they uh, testified amongst the, regarding the data that's being collected on our students that the department has within their possession. They receive 30 to 40 applications per year from third parties requesting that the, our students' private data is shared out. So in that, that hearing, I asked the question, so of the third parties that you're sharing with, how many times have you audited their technology systems to ensure that the data is properly being protected? And their answer was, it has been at least a decade. And that's a huge concern. Because the technology systems where, let's just take it for granted, that the technology systems and the controls in place for our students' private data in the department are sound. Once that data is transferred to a third party on a third party's technology system, those controls cannot be validated. And if there's a breach, the controls and processes may not be in place for proper notification and proper protection. So it is a common uh, industry best practice to audit the technology systems of those third parties by which third party data is shared. But again, the department uh, testified that that hasn't happened in at least a decade with our students' data. So big data is big money. And uh, Representative Hillstrom just asked the question, is this happening uh, widespread? Absolutely, because it is a billion dollar industry. Collecting massive amounts of information and data mining it for purposes of building profiles on us that third parties can use for actionable uh, uh, information is, a lot, is, as these graphics show, uh, a big industry. So a couple headlines here, ripped from the headlines regarding data mining. Uh, how companies know now know everything about you, every detail of your life, what you buy, where you go, whom you love, etc. The volume and diversity of data being captured by companies today is staggering. Using techniques ranging from supermarket loyalty cards to targeting it, targeted advertising on Facebook, private companies systematically collect very personal information from who you are, what you do, what you buy, and so on. So data mining examples here, that one of my, my favorites is the Target, for those who haven't seen this. This dates back to uh, 2013, if you haven't seen this headline. So there was a father who had a daughter in high school who uh, they began to receive coupons in the mail from Target. And reading the, the article here, a, a, in response to receiving those coupons, a man, the father, walked into Target outside Minneapolis demanding to see the store manager. Mm -hmm. The father was angry over coupons for baby clothes and cribs that had been sent to his daughter who was still in high school. How dare Target encourage teen pregnancy, he ranted. The manager apologized and the father went home. Then uh, the manager called a few days later to apologize again. On the phone, however, the father said he had had a talk with his daughter and it turned out she was pregnant and the father apologized to the manager. How did Target know this? It's based on the profiling that they do, based on consumer habits, uh, probably from a, a Target loyalty card or one of the cards that they have. They track the consumer purchases. And through data mining, it's been determined that a, a woman, when she's become pregnant, her consumer habits change in what she purchases and the quantities thereof. And they have, down to a science, been able to determine when that's the case, and they begin to send out proactively these coupons. That's just one example of, of the power of data mining. 
Also last year in education policy, this is, is uh, very concerning. This is MinLink. If you haven't heard of MinLink, it's a centralized database. I took this screenshot right off of the University of Minnesota's website. And down at the bottom there, you can see, supported by the National Science Foundation. You see in the center there, that is a, an integrated database. The, and there are multiple databases around it that are feeding the MinLink integrated database. And you can see there on the top, there are four education-related databases that MDE is feeding into it, which includes academic data records, or student academic records, academic disciplinary records, standardized test records database, the MCAs, and Education Minnesota testing <coughs> records. So combining that with other department data. So from Department of, of uh, Human Services, you have child protection records that are being fed in, children's mental health records that are being fed in to Minley. Uh, Medicaid claims from the Department of Corrections, you, there are records of incarcerated adults being fed in. Uh, juvenile court records and uh, so on. The question was asked of MDE when they were uh, in front of Ed Policy and they admitted that the data was not being sanitized, meaning it could be determined which individuals from the department at least the data belonged to. So sanitizing data means stripping the individual's name but providing the rest so that the, the, the rest of the data might be valuable for research purposes, but there isn't a need to link that to an individual. But in this case, that wasn't happening because whatever the University of Minnesota, the National Science Foundation, and others, whatever research they're, they're doing with this uh, MinLink database, they want individuals' names. And can you see here how a profile can be created based on their academic history, and then once they become adults, link that up with corrections, et cetera? Where's that data going? Who's it being shared with? How is it being destroyed? Very spooky stuff, very alarming. So with data that's been collected that exists on, uh, on uh, technology systems, there are definitely uh, concerns for data breaches. But data breaches come in two forms. The first form is those gaining access who are not authorized. That's the most common form that most people are familiar with called hacking, for example. So obtaining access to data not authorized to access. But the second type of data breach is uh, very important as well, and that is those who do have authorized access abusing the access that they have. So I have a few examples here from uh, Minnesota government data breaches of both types. Here in January of 2013, 5,000 alerted of records breach in abuse of driver's data by a DNR employee. Uh, in February of 2014, KMSP anchor uh, lawsuit claims cop snoop snooping on her license. Another one ripped from the headlines, August of 2015, driver's license data of 18 individuals accessed. Uh, this one is February of 2013, new lawsuit over data breach of driver's license data joins ever-growing list. This one is from April of 2015, Metropolitan State University, 160,000 student records were breached. This one is uh, Minsher, an in-house flaw faulted uh, in Minsher data breach, 1,600 social security numbers were breached. By the way, when this uh, breach happened, this was at the advent of Minsher, a brand new technology system that was being stood up. Not a legacy system, but a brand new technology system. Presumably, they would be introducing new technology and best practices, etc. And even with that, there was still a breach. This one is from February 2013. Audit finds common misuse of drivers, Minnesota driver data. So the solution, uh, which is what this bill seeks to do, uh, is to put controls in place to protect student private data, to ensure parental authority over their children's private data. This bill is not intended to prevent schools from engaging in day-to-day -day operations. The bill is not intended to prevent teachers from teaching students, not to limit the use of technology in the classroom. The bill is not uh, intended to prevent schools from having rosters or brochures printed for sports events. 
It's not intended to prevent your books from being printed and distributed. It's not intended to prevent photography services, the ordering of class rings, etc. Regulatory compliance and having controls in place is not new to the technology space. So it's been well established uh, of the necessity to establish controls to protect private data. And so I have a couple examples here. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley was the product of the Enron Arthur Anderson scandal back in the early uh, 2000s. There was a need, uh, a recognized need to control data. So Sarbanes-Oxley applies to US-based uh, publicly traded companies. Graham Leach Bliley Act, GLBA. That is the, it's a similar type of protection of data integrity uh, applying to financial institutions. Uh, HIPAA and high tech, similar data controls applying to the health uh, uh, or, uh, organizations. And then there's the payment card industry, PCI. That is for merchants and those are similar standards that apply to the handling of data, sensitive data in the, that, that has to do with credit cards. So, Concluding here, uh, the law protecting student privacy data is long out of date, not only in Minnesota, but across the nation. This is a very complex issue because technology in the schools touches many other areas, but this issue is extremely important and, and the time to act is right now. And I fully recognize and acknowledge the langu before, language before us is not perfect. And that's why I look forward to working with all stakeholders to improve upon and create the strongest possible language to accomplish our intent of protecting student private data and ensuring parental authority. So an overview of the bill, Madam Chair and committee. Uh, so section three, that is uh, taking definitions, standardizing definitions for multiple areas of, of the statutes and try, trying to create a common definition set. Section four specifies requirements for student information system contracts between schools and vendors, because right now it's an unregulated space. The details of the contracts is something that needs to be addressed. Opt-in agreements required for the collection of data and sharing with third parties. Clarifies who has authority, uh, uh, who is authorized to access data, school employees, parents, etc. cetera. Uh, section four also require requirements uh, to delete the data. And also includes directory <laughs> information being permitted. Section five has to do with one-to-one -one technology being regulated. And that uh, is such as iPads or other technology or software that is linked one to one. So a student logging in to a particular application or a student using a particular uh, asset, hardware asset, where the actions thereof could be linked to that student. So that's what section five addresses. Technology assigned or authenticated to a single individual. Section six deals with limitations on the use of evidence obtained in violation of these sections is inadmissible in civil or criminal proceedings. Section seven is annual training required for the protection of data. And there are, again, I understand there are other sections, but that's a highlight there of uh, most of the, the bill itself. And with that, Madam Chair, I do have some testifiers that I'd like to call forward. All right. Um, oh, okay, Representative Lucero, if you wanna have your first Testifier come forward, that'd Perfect. be great. You can all come up. Oh. Good morning, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, my name is Chris Daniels. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Uh, my name is Chris Daniels. I'm a board member of Minnesotans, Minnesota Advocates and Champions for Children. As a concerned parent, not working not just on behalf of my children, but of all children of our state, I'm, I appreciate letting myself and Max speak today. Well over 140-10. With all the attention given to the data and data breaches that occur in our quickly advancing society, these numbers should frighten you. Target, Cub Foods, Super Value, J.P. Morgan Chase, Home Depot, Neiman Marcus, White Lodging Services, Sally Beauty, Michaels, Eleven Brand Casinos, P.F. Chang's, UPS, Dairy Queen, Goodwill, Jimmy John's, Kmart, Staples, BB, Sony, Jewel Osco are just some of the names of the major data breaches that have occurred in the last four years. Everyone with an electronic form of payment in their wallet or purse knows a sense of dread that overcomes them when, when a data breach is reported. What will that mean for their next week, month, or year? 
the hassle of getting a card will my identity be stolen? Will somebody destroy my credit? Yet the numbers 40 and 10 should matter more. However, the, however they have seemed to slip through the cracks. 40 is the number of entities that the MDE shares uh, the data of our children. 10 is the number of years that have gone by without an audit to check for a breach, as evidenced by the testimony given last year by the MDE. Simply put, Minnesota parents don't know who their children's data has been shared with or if it has been lost to cyberspace and nefarious characters. According to, th to a 2016 report from Identity Theft Resource Center and CyberScout, major data breaches increased by 40% in 2016. In 2017, the Identity Theft Resource Center reports that through May tw March 21st, there have already been 353 breaches. This represents a 56% increase over just two years ago. Obviously, we have a society that's seeing technology advancing at a rate that history has never seen. From testing, surveys, and one-to-one -one learning, our children are inundated with data mining technology that didn't exist five years ago, and that many people couldn't even imagine just 10 years ago. However, protections to help counter the dangers of this digital exposure have not been addressed. Our children's data privacy, financial future, and basic innocence need to be protected. There are far too many stories of a stolen future that exist. It is time for the protections of our children in this electronic world to be addressed and updated. This bill will help address concerns that all parents have about the future of their children and helps protect the innocence that all children should have. This is truly a subject that should not be partisan. Our children are not partisan. They are our future, and our future needs to be protected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Next testifier. Good morning. Madam Welcome Chair to and Representatives. My name is Kirsten Schultz. I am a parent and citizen lobbyist for Minnesota Advocates and Champions for Children. HF 1507 will not change the way school districts can use technology. It will not restrict the teachers in their use of testing or online curriculum. This bill is about how the collected data is handled. Another area of this bill that I fully support is the necessities for teachers to understand more about how to handle the student data concerning third parties. The last section of this bill implements timely training for all teachers, staff, IT directors, and other individuals who access student data regarding FERPA, which is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, in order to prevent unauthorized access or disclosure of student data. Additional training would either be annual or as need, as need arises. With data being collected through programs like Class Dojo, TIES, Infinite Campus, along with testing, survey, online curriculum, and apps, this is why training on FERPA is so important. With privacy being so valued, it is imperative that teachers receive this training to help protect our children's data. No teacher or administrator attends to put our, intends to put our children's data at risk. Unfortunately, with the mind-numbing pace of changes happening in this arena, time to examine the effects and possibilities has not taken place. Teachers are closest to the students in the educational setting, and it is important that they have this opportunity to understand more about student data. The burden of developing this training would not be on districts or MDE, as the U.S. Department of Education and Family Compliance Policy Office provides forms, best practices, and visual training. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Good morning, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Madam, <clears throat> excuse me. Madam Chair, committee members, good morning. Um, I'm here on behalf, I'm Linda Bell, <coughs> and I'm here on behalf of Minnesota Advocates and Champions for Children and our over 5,000 members who routinely question the use of children's data without their parental consent. My role with MAC is primarily working with parents across our state, answering their questions and trying to help empower them to better go back and work with their schools and, uh, and, and on issues like data privacy. So thank you for hearing my testimony. Uh, based upon our research and, and for many others' personal experience, we know that when students log into their computers using their personal SSID login, their data, file, their data flies instantaneously to a number of different entities. This handout, which you might have, shows an individual student's single data stream within our own state and just happens to include some of the governmental data collection. Let me create a picture for you. Where does the data go? It goes to school district warehouses, state and government, uh, state and federal government agencies, including 40 plus contracts maintained by the MDE and 150 plus 
contracts maintained by the U.S. DOE. It goes to the Mars system. It goes to the MDE approved vendors like Ties and Infinite Campus. It goes to survey companies and or recipient third parties, testing companies, online curriculum companies, applications, apps, universities, research entities, the state longitudinal data system, nonprofits, the MinLink data system that Representative Lucero spoke about at the University of Minnesota, and third parties of all kinds, including Google, eScholar, Interactive Health Technologies, Khan Academy, Newton, LearnBoost, LearnSprout, Moodle, and Noodle, and literally thousands of educational technology companies and products. This is a simple single stream of data here, but when third parties are included, we can multiply the number of streams many, many times over. When our, state when our state students log on to their computers, we can liken this action to the clicking on of a fountain with multiple streams of water flowing all at the same time. This is our, our children's data being released. Many of our parents ask, how can school districts keep track of where personal student information is going and whether it is being shared by entities who are supposed to safeguard and keep our children's data secure. Once student and family data is out there on the open market, it is sold and resold over and over again. My family has experienced this firsthand with a data school, with a breach um, from a school district. So just a couple of quick facts. We know that in 2013, the College Board and ACT was sued for selling PII, personally identifiable information. In 2014, the SAT was included in that litigation. In 2013, UC Berkeley students sue Google over privacy invasion. In 2014, parents sue Google over their apps for education, whereby Google scanned contents of email messages which allegedly violates federal and state wiretap laws. And most recently, in January 2017, the Mississippi State Attorney sues Google over online tracking of students in his state violating the state consumer protection laws. To give you an idea, total advertising revenues made up 91% of Google's $55.5 billion uh, profits in the year 2013, and that's when online learning really got started. That's four years ago. I, I hasten to, to note what it might be now, but this is a significant percentage of which is likely to be derived from the 30 million students who number among the 425 million users worldwide. How interesting is it that Google is offering these educational products? To restate, how concerned is Google that our nation's students are being highly educated? Clearly, Google has been sued numerous times, promises to stop data mining and selling student PII, but then continues on their way. How do these companies get away with sharing and selling student PII? Many times it's in the contracts with the schools. For example, Khan Academy, based in California and previously known for its really outstanding math curriculum, Khan provides free web-based tutorial services in exchange for the user's data. It's in the contract. They get the academic progress, the internet browsing habits of students, among other personal information that students put online. Our state's children are having their personal habits and academic pursuits, their very identities, stolen, shared, and sold. HF1507 will bring some much needed protections to students and families. Very simply, by helping, student, by helping schools implement best practices in handling data. The fourth section in the bill titled Student Information Systems provides specific requirements that must be in a contract with a school and a software provider related to the security of the student data that's transmitted or collected and requires that the contracts include provisions identifying who owns the data, how to handle a data breach, how and when data must be destroyed, how and, da how and when data can be accessed, and prohibitions to the sale of data. That's important. And so Mac heartily endorses HF1507 and seeks your serious consideration.
Thank you for your testimony. Thank Representative you. Lucero, do you have any other testifiers? I do have one more, Ben Feist from the, oh, there he is. Okay. And then after him, Margaret Weston from Osseo School District. Good morning, please state your name for the record and go on with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ben Feist. I'm the Legislative Director for the ACLU of Minnesota. Thank you for taking the time to hear this important bill this morning and thank you to Representative Lucero uh, for his work over the past several years. <clears throat> Uh, during these last several years, there has been a growing bipartisan consensus that we need to empower Minnesotans to take control of their privacy and bring our digital privacy laws into the 21st century. It makes a lot of sense that we're looking at this on the state level and that other states are doing this as well. As we're all aware, the federal government moves incredibly slow on these issues, if at all, and in terms of internet privacy, it appears that we're moving backwards, unfortunately. Today, governments and corporations are armed with powerful tools that enable them to get at our personal information without our knowledge or consent. The risk these tools present to Americans' privacy is made far worse by the fact that our privacy laws have failed to keep pace with the new technologies. Corporations should only be able to access our personal data or our children's data if we have given them clear and explicit permission to do so. The same rule applies to the government. The government should not be allowed to obtain this information without either your permission or a warrant issued by a judge. Using stealthy, secret, or concealed technologies to get your data without your knowledge and consent is not acceptable, and we need stronger laws to prevent it from happening and to punish those who do it. This is especially the case when it comes to protecting the privacy of Minnesota's children. By introducing this legislation, Representative Lucero has recognized that our laws should empower parents and children to decide who they want to share personal private information with. Despite the sensitivity of the information, limitations on access to and use of this information by third parties and school officials are frequently weak or non-existent, which means private corporations and law enforcement often have easy access to detailed information about our children without their parents ever knowing about it. This act retains the benefits of these important technologies to advance our school's educational goals while empowering parents and students to reasonably restrict who has access to that personal information. The bill first addresses student information systems. Information that used to be stored in a file cabinet in the principal's office is now being uploaded onto remote third party servers, sometimes even in real time. Despite the sensitivity of this information, which includes students' grades, social security numbers, disability status, and information on whether they have been disciplined, received remedial help, or qualify for free lunch, few limitations exist on how third parties can get access and use of the data stored, and those rules do not, that do exist are far too easy to circumvent. This is especially troubling because some of that information, if it were to become publicly available or end up in the wrong hands, could prove very damaging to a student. This bill prevents student information system providers from accessing and sharing personal student data on their systems unless doing so is for a specific educational purpose that benefits the student, the school, or the educational system, or where they have sought and received limited and specific permission from the student uh, <coughs> and or the student's parents, uh, the student data is highly valuable and easily monetized as a resource. And we need to protect our kids from companies who are taking advantage of their relationship with educational institutions in order to get access to it. Second, the bill addresses one-to-one -one programs. Um, I think it's important to note that since its original version, uh, this bill has been stripped down. It's still fairly long, but it really only deals with these two specific technologies that we're talking about today. <clears throat> An increasing number of schools today participate in this one-to-one -one technology program where a third party provides free laptops or, um, or tablet computers such as iPads for the school year. While these programs are highly beneficial, they also enable third party device providers and school officials to track and monitor everything a student does with the device without the children's parents ever knowing about it. This includes what websites a child visits, what information they read online, what the contents of their emails say, and in extreme cases, even includes remote activation device webcams. That's happened uh, in other jurisdictions and it's been highly troubling to those involved. The challenge one-to-one programs is that device providers frequently use 
the devices to obtain personal information about students who use them and to build a commercial record on those students, whether the students want to be monitored or not. Students should not have to choose between having uh, access to important technology and preserving their privacy. Telling students they can choose to protect their privacy by not accepting the one-to-one -one device is a false choice because such an option essentially tells students they can either protect their privacy by declining the device and be at an educational disadvantage compared to other students or give up their privacy, get the device, and improve the quality of their education. This is an unfair choice to ask students to make and it should be prohibited. No one wants Minnesota schools to become a place where st only students with financial means to purchase their own laptop or tablet computer can afford to keep their privacy and get a top-notch education. This bill is designed to retain the, benefit, the benefits of one-to-one -one device programs while empowering parents and students free of any coercion to reasonably restrict who has access to the device and the sensitive and personal information that may be on it. Device providers may still secure benefits from providing the devices, such as gaining early brand loyalty from students, as long as they do not infringe on student privacy. We look forward to continuing to work on this issue uh, as the bill moves forward. And uh, again, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Feist. Um, we have one other testifier, and then please stick around in case others um, have questions for you. Uh, Ms. Weston, Margaret Weston. Good morning, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Margaret Weston. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, comment about the uh, proposed legislation concerning student information systems. I'm here today as the general counsel for the Osseo Area Schools, um, Independent School District number 279. Osseo I'm sorry, excuse me, Ms. Weston, could you speak up a little oh, bit? We're having sorry. problems with the mics yes. this morning. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So I'm the general counsel for the Osseo Area Schools, school district number 279. Osseo Area Schools serves over 20,000 students and is the fifth largest school district in the state of Minnesota. We have over 25 school or program sites in the district. House file 1507 has been changed considerably since the last draft and is much more consistent with other laws governing the operations of schools and for that I um, congratulate uh, um, Representative Lucero. Um, and it still contains some inconsistencies with current law regulating searches of district owned property and other reasonable suspicion searches by school district personnel. I'm not going to comment on those issues. I will be we will be working to uh, iron out those differences over the summer, I believe. Um, but I, the point I would like to make with my testimony today, however, is the negative impact that students' educational experience uh, that I believe can follow the requirement that students and parents opt into the, an electronic record keeping system used by their schools rather than allowing an opt out system. Schools in Minnesota use electronic record systems for attendance, grades, discipline records, health plans, class schedules, parent family emergency contact information, IEPs, and 504 plans. I am not aware of school districts that collect so social security numbers on those student information systems, um, but they do uh, use the systems for operating the school systems. The electronic systems are designed to allow access to the records based on the job requirements of the employees. In other words, um, a, a teacher has access to information about that teacher's students, but not uh, information about other students. An attendance clerk has um, authorized access to attendance information, but not to student grades. And those can be regulated by the um, uh, password logon for the, the individual employees, which can be changed um, to keep up with changing uh, personnel and student, um, student information. We're also required by law to file electronic reports of student test scores, behavior, and other aspects of student life to the Minnesota Department of Education. It is the Osseo Area Schools experience that when parents are required to opt into a program or opportunity such as a field trip, we can expect hundreds of families not to opt in to even an individual school, and that is through generally through oversight, the loss of the um, permission form, uh, parents are not able to find it, they've lost it, and that would not be, um, that is only through inadvertence or when there's a desire to participate and the parents just don't get around to signing in the opt-in. I would assume that for this particular type of service there would be people who would uh, choose not to opt-in as well as the 
hundreds if, of families who, through carelessness or lack of communication or their chaotic lifestyles, we have, you know, obviously homeless students, we have students who are uh, highly mobile, they would not be able to locate the appropriate form and get it to the right place at the right time. So in a system of 20,000 students, um, we would have probably two or more students in each classroom who have not opted into the uh, program, such as the um, electronic attendance, uh, electronic grades, and class scheduling. Those records would have to be maintained in a separate paper system for those students. Maintaining separate paper files for this large number of students would be particularly disruptive in our middle schools and high schools. Class schedules are prepared electronically based on each student's requests in the space available. With both an electronic and a paper system involving a large number of students, the schedules could not be finalized until both the students in the electronic system and the paper system have been included. Operating the dual system would predictably delay finalization of class schedules and increase chances for errors. Electives may not be offered if there are not enough students who have expressed an interest in a class, causing uncertainty for both students and staff until the schedule can be finalized. In a high school with nearly 3,000 students, such as our Maple Grove Senior High, there would predictably be well over um, 100 students who could, would have been assigned classes separately using the paper system. Coordinating the two systems is inherently more likely to lead to delays and mistakes in course assignments, causing disruptions for students who need specific courses to meet their needs to fulfill their dreams. Protecting paper files under lock and key rather than through encryption and password protection can also have a negative impact on a student's experience in the case of a health or safety emergency. For instance, access to a student's health plan or emergency contact information can be made immediately by an employee with access to the electronic system. Locating the key to the correct filing cabinet and locating the paper file in the cabinet pro provides many opportunities for delay. The use of a separate paper system would also cause delays for students who change schools within the Osseo School District. Our schools are best able to serve our students if they have immediate access by the appropriate individuals to a student's health plans, 504 plans, behavior plans, or IEPs, rather than waiting for paper files to arrive. Finally, paper systems are often less secure than electronic systems that have encrypted password protected access. Paper records are not encrypted and password protected so that it is more likely that some school district employee accessing attendance records, for instance, for a legitimate reason, would inadvertently access other information. Paper files do not turn into a blank screen if the person reviewing them gets called away on an emergency and is not able to refile the paper in a timely manner. So while we, um, appreciate the concern for privacy, um, and I'm not going to address any of the, the issues raised about the one-to-one -one devices and the access by the providers. For the student information system, um, we believe that there are some inherent um, drawbacks to the opt-in system rather than an opt-out system. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, we'll move to member questions. Representative Lesh. I have a question. Oh, that was from previous. Representative Smith. Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair. And to the testifier, nothing specific about your comments. I just wanted to thank you for coming down um, and testifying, uh, representing one of the best school districts in the entire state. <laughs> An award-winning school district, I may add. Yes. Indeed. Very good. Um, other member questions? Um, Representative Carlson. Uh, not a question, Madam Chair, just a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Lucero, uh, I applaud your uh, work on this um, in protecting children's uh, privacy data rights. I agree, it's very alarming to the number of breaches that have occurred both uh, within the private sector as well as within the government sector, as you pointed out in your uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, but I think for all of us that are here, uh, you know, I think it would uh, be, I would be remiss to not point out the contrast between your presentation and what we heard with, uh, with Representative Whalens. I, I think we need to put this uh, politics aside and start working for all Minnesotans to protect everybody's data privacy uh, because this is a common factor regardless of the group that we're trying to, to, um, to protect. We need to be mindful that uh, there are consider uh, significant concerns when it comes to data uh, privacy. It's not usually a matter of if, but a matter of when uh, those breaches may occur. So uh, just wanted to draw that to everybody's attention. And again, uh, if we can have this kind of approach, this kind of uh, holistic approach towards protecting everyone's data privacy, I think we'd be best serving all Minnesotans. So thank you. 
Any member questions regarding Representative Lucero's bill? Uh, Representative Lucero, um, so the bill distinguishes between um, the information that Ms. Weston was addressing where it's student um, uh, attendance records and their grades and those sorts of things. And is your bill saying that um, those, that information system should also be an opt-in? Uh, Madam Chair, the, the intent of the bill is is not to, it's to address the collection of information and then the, the sharing by third parties. That's in my opening comments, that's why I mentioned this. The bill is not intended to uh, hamper the the day-to-day -day operations of the school district and the ability to educate our children. That That's not the intent of the bill because it's, it's well, it's understood that there is a need to collect attendance, to collect grades, et cetera. But it's, it's the question of after that's done and outside of the scope of the school district, where's that data going? Who is it being shared with? How is it being data mined? So you're absolutely right, Madam Chair. There is a distinction between data within the school for use of, of the school and by the school for purposes of, of educating children by district employees, et cetera, then uh, uh, versus the, the, that data outside of the control of the school district after it's been shared uh, and so on. All right, thank you. And Ms. Weston then, um, the information that you said um, it, would be, it would be problematic to get an opt-in for uh, being, uh, you know, the attendance, the grades, uh, behavior, I think, issues you, you mentioned. Um, where does any of that information go other than within the school district? Madam Chair, that information has to be uh, forwarded to the Minnesota Department of Education for their compilations uh, for statewide record keeping. So the school district gathers, um, for instance, behavior data. There's a code for each type of behavior, uh, suspensions, um, that, and that is uh, transmitted to the Minnesota Department of Education for their uses. Okay. And, and I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but um, does it does that information ever leave the Minnesota Department of Education? Madam Chair, I, I am not aware of that information ever leaving um, the Department of Education other than in aggregate form. Okay. And there are reports about the numbers of expulsions per year, for instance. Thank you. And so is there anyone here from the Minnesota Department of Education? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Weston. Good morning, welcome to the committee. If you could state your name for the record. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members, Kevin McHenry, Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Education. Um, first and foremost, appreciate uh, you bringing the bill forward, Representative Lucero. The discussion uh, is very important. Um, in terms of data um, that comes into the Minnesota Department of Education the Depart and data that is shared, um, Ms. Weston was correct. Uh, for the most part, all data is uh, uh, the personal identifiable uh, identifiers are all stripped um, for public uh, purposes. We do need to make sure that we are reporting how schools are performing. Um, so we have a way of uh, reporting on our website and to districts how each uh, district is uh, performing on their exams. Um, if there are cell sizes of uh, ten, or less than 10 for any student, we suppress any data. For any data that's used for research purposes, which are allowed under FERPA, um, that um, data would be shared under a data sharing agreement. Um, the only time data uh, that would be shared outside of MDE, it would have to be with the research institution. It would have to have a specific purpose as to why they would need to connect any personal identifiers. Um, the, the research in institution would have to uh, have a way of protecting that student data, and the research institution would have to destroy that data after uh, the research was conducted. Um, thank you, and could you give me an example of maybe a time that that's been done, where there's been research done on Minnesota students' aggregate information? Sure, Madam Chair. Um, a recent example um, revolves the uh, MCAs in college and career readiness. Um, indicator. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the, in the Education Committee passed a bill where we had to develop uh, a college and career readiness indicator. So for example, if a student uh, scored a specific score on the MCAs, if that was equivalent to a certain score on a college entrance exam, uh, we did an alignment study um, to determine what that college and career readiness indicator score would be uh, to align with uh, a college entrance exam. Um, 
to, to enter into a, um, a state uh, institution it or college institution. Last year, uh, the legislature did pass a bill where not only where that uh, where that study that we provided for the college and career readiness indicator, um, we needed to go further in depth. So it required Minnesota State to actually do a study uh, to determine if our scores were valid. The way that they determined our scores were valid is that they uh, we had to enter into a data sharing agreement with Minnesota State, where they had to link data from students uh, and how they performed on the MCAs in 11th grade. Uh, with how they performed in their coursework in uh, the first year of Minnesota State. What they did for that study was determine what students scored, did they have to do remedial coursework or not, um, and they came up with a specific score. Uh, so now if a student scores a specific score on the MCA reading or a specific score on the MCA uh, math, they would not be required to do any remediation. So the Minnesota State did that study. They, uh, um, uh, to link that data, once they uh, finished that study, that data was destroyed. And did you have a way of following up to assure that that happened? Uh, and Madam Chair, uh, members, that's required under all of our data sharing agreements uh, that we uh, enter into. So yes, we did um, we did follow up with Minskew after or Minnesota State after that study was done to ensure that they have uh, followed through with uh, requirements of that data sharing agreement. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that example. I think that gives um, members a clear idea of of what might happen to that data if it leaves MDE. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just add one example to your exact question. Um, I, I flip back to the, the MinLink slide. So you can see here uh, from MDE, we have student academic records and student disciplinary records being uh, submitted, which is personally identified. And that's being combined with, for example, um, uh, incarceration records from the Department of Corrections. And so we can see a linking of that information. So the question becomes, did parents know that this is occurring? Should parents know that their student's data is being uploaded? And if they, if one believes that they should know, that's the purpose of the opt-in, is to empower parents to put them back in as the decision makers versus government and business being the decision makers of where students' private information is being sent. Thank you. Um, other member questions? Representative uh, Pugh. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just realized no microphones. Yeah. Um, I, well, I don't have a, a question. I just um, wanted to offer a, a comment, a, a note of appreciation to Representative Lucero for the amazing work that you've done to heighten um, all of our awareness um, about um, about this subject matter. And I also wanted to express appreciation for how you've obviously worked uh, collaboratively uh, with the stakeholders on both sides of the aisle. This is not and should not be a, a partisan issue. Um, obviously the whole focus is doing right by our kids and, and parents. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. And I also wanted to take a moment and thank the uh, great testifiers from the Minnesota Advocates and Champions for Children. Love the name of your organization and um, just wanted to thank you for your excellent testimony as well for being here today. Representative Lesh. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for oh. I was talking about that. Thank you for uh, bringing this up, uh, Reps of Lucero. And you know, I hope that your presentation gives all of us pause, uh, including in light of, of several matters, the uh, Representative Whalen's bill, which is the last bill, but also just on the floor the other day where uh, we thought that folks should hear evidence uh, on seatbelts, and you've got in here. On uh, page 16, that you can't introduce this evidence uh, in a in a proceeding. So, the important thing about this committee, Madam Chair, is I like to think that in most cases we can we can try to be consistent with the politics. I mean, this place is a political place. There's no question about it. But I like to think that in this committee we can try to uh, sift through some of that so we get to good policy that isn't driven primarily by our own subject matter politics when we get here, which is why I think, um, Representative Lucero, your bill here is really important. I, I think it does do that. We still have to have conversations about this, where we draw the lines, but it helps us to, to be consistent policy-wise, and we're not just falling on our swords for our favorite special interest group of the day. 
because uh, at the end of the day, we end up having to fix those <laughs> policies years later when we realize, oh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, but thank you for bringing this. I, I was happy to, to be a co-op on, on this bill in previous years, and hopefully we can move forward on a, a robust discussion of this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lash. And you know what? Um, there's a reason that there are different data, data classifications in statute because different data has to be treated in different ways. And so um, I, I too appreciate Representative Lucero bringing this bill. And um, I, I hope that the, I know I see a lot of stakeholders in the room here. And if you haven't gotten in touch with Representative Lucero about the contents of this bill, I encourage you to do that over the interim because we will be moving something forward hopefully next year on student data privacy. Representative Whalen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to make a couple follow-up comments because a few times now we've compared the bill that I presented to this bill and I just would like to state for the record, we're not comparing apples to apples here. And if we're talking about consistency, when we look at the way we regulate uh, education, teachers are licensed, for example, we have lots of regulations for our schools. We don't license abortion clinics and so we want to be consistent in state law. Maybe we should look at licensing abortion clinics and then we can re-examine all the reporting requirements we currently have on hand, which was one of the very few ways we as lawmakers in the state of Minnesota have to hold abortion clinics accountable. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Again, I, I appreciate the feedback and I appreciate Representative Lesh and there's multiple uh, co-authors on both sides that are in this room and not in this room. And I. This is a very important issue, and I'm again, I cannot uh, speak highly enough of of my partners and stakeholders uh, from outside as well. And I, one of the point I wanted to reiterate was, I am obviously a technologist. That's what I've been doing for 15 years. But in in addition to that, I'm a former educator. I taught college for for seven years. So as both a technologist as an as an educator. I find both of those, uh, the topics, extremely important. And so I'm not trying to, as I'm reiterating, the goal is not to hamper the ability to educate and use technology in the education context. Just the opposite. As a technologist, I want to get as much technology in there as possible. This is about the data. This is about who is in control. Should it be the parents and the students, or should it be the government and the business making those decisions? So, Madam Chair, that's what this addresses, and I look forward to uh, working with the stakeholders over the interim and coming back next year so we can move this forward. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Chair and the members of the committee. Thank you, Representative Lucero.